Hi folks, we need to turn this chunk of Ren board into this. What is it? This is the back half of a lathe casting pattern for a 1943 South Bend lathe. Super excited to do this project. Let's dive in. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So what is Ren board or Ren shape? Well, actually that's not really what we're using. We're using Precision Board Plus from inventables.com, high density urethane foam for milling. Stuff's actually pretty fun to work with. This was my first time. Uh, not particularly cheap, 60 bucks for 12 by 12 by two inch. And as you can see here, unfortunately I didn't need two inches. I only needed one inch. So uh, we sawed it in half. Great rule of thumb when you're using a band saw is to think about how many teeth you have engaged at any one point in time. Generally, three to five is sufficient. So with thin walled stuff, you may want a finer pitch blade here. I quickly realized we needed to switch over to the coarse pitch blade and it cut better. Still a lot of teeth engaged. That's why we rocked it back and forth a little just to get it done. So Precision Board Plus is a generic version of effectively Ren Shape. Ren Shape is used in the modeling industry. I believe it's even used in Hollywood. Uh, and you can read all about it, you know, styling boards, proofing, modeling, prototyping, fabricating. If you do a Google image search, you can kind of get an idea of, you can use it to make signs, you can use it to make molds, car parts, casting patterns. I believe like in Hollywood, if they need to make a big part of a fire truck, they may just use this stuff. You can paint it and sand it. And again, aside from the fact that it's expensive, uh, it's pretty fun to work with. The best way I have to describe Ren Shape, it'd be like if styrofoam and drywall got together and had a baby. Using the Shearhog Max RPMs of 5100, 15 thou per tooth, that's about 76 inches a minute and 0.6 optimal load. We're taking a pretty darn aggressive cut. We're leaving 10 thou radial and axial. No problem handling it. We're just trying to hog the material out of here. We're using our Pearson vacuum plate. This works great. This is exactly what it's meant for. If you want to understand what kind of vacuum clamping pressure you've got, take the surface area of the part that you've got inside the gasket. And in this case, it was about seven inches times 12 inches times the 14. That's the number for pounds per square inch, I believe. About 1,100 pounds of hold down force, which here is great. One thing I did want to keep in mind or a lesson learned is you can chip this stuff. Uh, and that was a bummer. So using a big positive rake tool like this with a big feed per tooth might cause chipping. I didn't do enough experimenting to really tell. Uh, but again, something to keep in mind. Next up, I want to clean that surface up. We used a 3D horizontal strategy with a half inch end mill. Again, max RPMs, seventh thou per tooth, about 72 inches a minute. We had a couple of nooks and crannies to clean up, which I took care of with this tool 31, our quarter inch tool, just to get the inside radiuses for this cover plate. And then finally, we've got to do some surfacing. Max RPMs with a quarter inch ball end mill. Again, cooking seven thou per tooth. And it's a three flute end mill, so that's 105 inches a minute. 40 thou max step down. The trick to get this tool path is all in the second tab, geometry. We've picked those two, two chains, the green line here and the green line here. But then say I want the slope. So only between 0.1 and 89.9, and that allows it to correctly hug all this area here that's not zero or 90 degrees. Also check contact point boundary and contact only. Fusion does a great job describing the various 3D operations. And when you read about contour, you can see that it's meant really for steeper areas. And so that doesn't do such a hot job uh, at the top here. Actually, we're left, if you look, with a fair amount of stair stepping or water line. So the one way to fix that is to, to do a second contour, same containment zone. But what I did this time was I set the bottom height to be only 60 thou below my model top. So that's represented by this darker blue line right here. 
and then I did a smaller maximum step down of 0.5 inches. So it's a, a little bit of a hacky method, but it actually works quite well. So you've got the rougher strategy here, which again, as you look to the simulation, you can see as we step down, say from here to here, there's less scalloping because of where we're touching the tool. But when we get to the top here, you're gonna get much greater scalloping. That's why that second operation really helps. And finally, for the op one, a little one eighth inch end mill to come around and clean up this tighter inside corners. Now that we're moving to op two, I drew a little paper template to try to make sure I could maximize the work area hold down because we have a lot less here, the way we're holding op two. And so I wanna get the most of it, but I also want it to be reliable so that if we bump it just a hair by accident, uh, we don't actually lose all of our vacuum. The nice thing about the Pearson system is when that red button goes down, you know you've got full vacuum. After we swept it in, our zero is this point right here, which is where that line coincides that line. So that lets us use our Heimer to find those two points in our edges. Z zero is the bottom of the part uh, or the top of the vacuum plate. That's how I like to use a vacuum plate. It tends to keep you from diving or digging tools into the plate itself. I was going to do an adaptive strategy, but I realized a horizontal alone is plenty good and there's enough work holding here I also like a little bit reduced tool pressure using a multi-flute uh, half-inch tool versus a single flute three-quarter inch tool like the Shearhawk. Again, max RPM, seven thou per tooth. The stuff machines beautifully. And you know what's interesting is it actually makes a chip. It doesn't just turn to dust. If I did more of this, or frankly, even if I did another job, I would do, like we did in the Okamoto surface grinder rebuild, uh, take the time to build a cardboard or plastic mini enclosure, and that's gonna let you do a much better job of containing the dust. And that's really important for health reasons and really for keeping that dust from getting and contaminating. Uh, the worst thing would be inside of your whey oil, so it just sits there and grinds in between precision surfaces or scraped surfaces like Gibbs and Ways. After the horizontal, same thing where we do a contour to clean up most of the inside radius or fillet. another contour right on the floor to get those shallow areas. You can see a small amount of faceting on the floor and that's operator error. I suspect it may be from the part um, pushing down or springing up in areas where it had uh, vacuum been versus did not. So lesson learned there. You can also see some, some of the fracturing and chipping along the edges. Still, I was happy with it. We learned a lot. Um, we are able to sand this part or anybody can sand it, which is something I think is commonly done uh, with a lot of sand castings. It, that's not an excuse that we shouldn't do our best absolute job uh, when we machine it, but nevertheless, pretty fun to work with. Uh, stick around though next week's project. The final goal is this part here. And to do that, we have to machine this large part. And this thing is actually pretty darn big, a lot of material removal, some tricky work holding. We did some of it incredibly well. I was really happy with it. And we got our butt kicked on a couple parts. So thank you for watching. Take care, see you soon.